Nyawagoa. Um, Sego, Sego Guego. Hi, everyone. Um, Nyawa to Angela Washko for getting me here. That's so awesome. And I'm thrilled to be here and to be part of this exhibition with all these am amazing women and, uh, you know, cool people. Thank you, Golan. It's nice to see you again. We determined that it was about 16 years ago, did we say? No, a little bit longer even than we s when we saw it. Yeah, something like that, when we first met. So it's really cool that you're still doing, we're still doing it, doing the job. <laughs> and um, I'm also thankful to Conflict Kitchen, who is so cool. I had never heard of them before this. Uh, thanks to you, I've, I now know about them, and I was able to eat there today and to be totally impressed by their setup. It was really wonderful. So I'm going to talk to you today about my life as an avatar. And um, what I'm going to do is uh, talk, show you a little bit of uh, just a few small excerpts from Time Traveler TM, which is the work in hacking, modding, and remixing as feminist practice, and also uh, how it led me to the work that I'm doing now. So let us begin. The year was 1996. And I had just discovered thepalace.com. Anybody here in this room ever been to the palace? Yeah. Heather! <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, uh, I, okay. <clears throat> the palace was the first graphical chat room. So I was a young artist, uh, just was I still going to school even? I don't remember. No, I wasn't. I was working in an artist-run center. And uh, beside us, there was another artist-run center called Studio XX, which is a feminist um, kind of maker space. And they were doing these really cool things called uh, Femme Branchée, so basically wired woman salons. And uh, they would present some basically new technology or new work or something really cool on a very regular basis. And I would often go to these. And this one night, they showed the palace. And I was just smitten, you know, I w because I had also, one of the reasons why I liked it was not just the friendly, happy, smiley face avatars that they had, but also at the time I had just started meeting other native artists, other indigenous artists from across Canada. Prior to that, I had been, I, I knew no other indigenous artist who was like me in the sense that they were interested in contemporary artwork. Uh, they were, they were much more interested in, you know, when you think about traditional indigenous artwork, I think y we're thinking about the same thing, probably. And so, um, having started by working at this artist-run center, they started to send me to go to these national meetings of artist-run center people, and there were other native artists there who were doing this stuff, and it was it was so wonderful to meet them. However, this was the time before, before you know internet, right? Like, I mean, it's just, just starting, obviously, because the palace exists, but like, it's like, not everyone has an email address. There's no Skype, you know? And in fact, long distance calls were an issue still. Like, we would wait until Sundays because to call anybody long distance, like your grandma, because, you know, it was, a, it was only 30% the cost, you know? So basically, we're, we just could not figure out how to talk to one another, how to keep, maintain relationships over the vast geographical distance that is North America. And so when I saw this thing, I was like, oh my God, this is the tool that we can use as artists to talk to one another and look at each other's artwork. Now, not everyone else felt that way. <laughs> so, but nonetheless, I did a project called Cyber Pow Wow, and that was the whole goal. It was about basically getting these artists to, we were talking about uh, getting these indigenous artists to talk about art, technology, and culture, and indi you know indigenous culture, because like otherwise it's Golem's thing, <laughs> you know. <laughs> um, and you know who were we? How you know at that time it was still a question like can native people, can native artists work in the digital realm? Are you still a native artist if you work in the digital realm? Okay, obviously now we know the answer, but oh my God, we had to talk about it and we had to do artwork about it. So cyberpowwow.net is still online. I can talk about just this for hours, so I won't be talking about it that much, but I wanted you to know that that was my trajectory. That was where I began to be interested in this online um, communication and environment place, type of place. 
Oh, yeah. And oh, in case I did have this. Sorry. Here's what they look like back in the day. OK, so it's the little circles, the little faces are your avatar. That's the default avatar in, in the palace. And then because we were real good, we could make our own avatar. So I'm XOX. And of course, authenticity was an issue, right? How are we going to know it's really native people in there? Because it's the internet. And you can be anybody. And you could, ha you know, so I said, let's just give them all. Let, we're just going to make avatars for everybody. They're going to be all kinds of Indians. And people can all wear Indian avatars. And so that's just, they're all Indians. So that's what happened. Everyone who came in could like get an, av get an avatar that they wanted, that we had made and uh, be an Indian for a few hours. But we could tell. <laughs> 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 then, circa 19, I mean 2006, somebody showed me Second Life. And I was like, it's the palace all grown up. Right? So from 2D to 3D, we had, you know, we had bodies now. We could walk through the 3D space. And it had the added bonus of, you know, you could walk, run, and fly. You could build things in Second Life. It was very customizable with limitations. It has gotten more and more customizable over the years. But uh, how many people here know Second Life? Yeah. Um, so I love this ad because it says, you know, escape to the Internet's largest user-created 3D virtual world community. Who will you be? <laughs> I just love that. So... But what, and so of course I was interested in the social aspects of it. By this time, sorry, I should just say that <laughs> explore ruins before they were ruined. Is that the funny part? Okay. <laughs> By this time, I just, I should have said this on the last couple of slides somewhere back there about Cyber Pow Wow is we did four iterations of Cyber Pow Wow over from 1997 to 2004. And at that point, I sort of let it go. Uh, as being a, a basically, it, beca it became an online virtual gallery where I kept adding rooms, to inviting artists to add rooms to our palace. Um, and so now I'm I'm not really uh, too worried as or as much worried about like us talking to one another because it's 2006 and everyone's figured out email and uh, Skype and all these things and we're also there's we're just traveling around more. Um, and so what I was really interested in was how indigenous people were going to be depicted or represented in virtual spaces. And of course, I was also interested in, uh, there's, I mean, there's many things I'm very interested in, like the, our history and how it hasn't, uh, how there's different histories depending on who's talking, as we all, you know, everyone here, educated people, we all know this already. But how can we show it? How are ways to show it? And then... My biggest thing that I had when thinking about history and thinking about images of native people, I was like, there are no images of native people in the future. There's like Chakotay from Star Trek and there's Raven from Snow Crash. Who else? I couldn't think of, there's like nobody, you know? Not, you know. So I was like, all right, that's, that's my job. <laughs> I need to show, you know, because if there's no native people in the future, then we're not going to be in the future. If we can't even visualize ourselves there, then we're lost. And so I felt like that was something that I could do in my community that was useful and gave me lots of joy. <laughs> and so um, I created this, uh, this machinima called Time Traveler TM. So Time Traveler TM, uh, actually, I think the best way to introduce it is to show the first episode. So the first episode's just a little over <laughs> five minutes. <laughs> and uh, I'm going to play it for you now. My name is Rodorod Steerhouse. Rodorod means hunter in Mohawk. That's what people call me, hunter. I'm a Mohawk, not a Mohican, okay? We survived. Like my father and my father's father, I can use a bow and arrow like nobody's business. I can also paddle a canoe faster than most speedboats and more quietly than your mother's orgasm. And like the legends say, I can walk the high steel without a worry. Hell, I can do gymnastics up there. 
All these traditional skills would have made me one serious breadwinner once, a couple of hundred years ago when us Indians still made up the majority of Turtle Island. But today, in an overmediated, hyper-consumerist North America, without enough room for everybody, I have to be content with being a ruthless, efficient, cold-blooded killer. That pisses me off. Okay, cold-blooded killer is not exactly the politically correct term for what I do. Bounty hunter sounds better. Hired gun also works, though it lacks sophistication. I did spend some time in the Marine Corps, also like most of my relatives. But you know, fighting other people's wars is starting to get boring. I'm thinking maybe I need a new aim in life. Screen. On. Traveling through time these days is easy, thanks to Time Traveler TM. Witness important historical events or interact with the people who made them happen. You can even customize your own events and visit with your great, 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 great grandmother. All customized characters must have existed. It's easy and fun. Visit www.timetravelertm.com. Time Traveler TM, on. Yeah, they use these in schools for history class. It takes all the known facts about a particular event in history, a speech, a battle, a day in the life of, and recreates it for you in living color. It's basically like going into a full-on 3D chat room and hanging out with famous dead people, like Geronimo. I'm interested in a little hand-to-hand -hand combat. It's one of my specialties. So, let's try Indian and Massacre. More than 86,000 hits, but most of them talk about Indians being massacred. I want to know about Indians who are doing some massacring. Let me try the trusty random function. Figure odds are good that I'll get to see some good old fashioned killing, at least. I figure a little visiting with my ancestors, a little recon with my role models, could do me some good right now. Give me a new perspective. Go ahead, call it a vision quest. I'm in fly on the wall mode, because I don't plan on taking part in the action. But there must have been some mistake, because I'm not at any massacre. I'm in some stupid barn or something with a bunch of white guys who've got to be cops. It looks like there's going to be a show. Where are the Indians? Where are the massacres? Good evening, men. Tonight, on account of it being Christmas time and all, we have a special treat. Mr. Nestor Vance's Great Panorama of the West. Ooh. They call this thing a moving picture, only it's not even automated. It's a bunch of bad paintings sewn together and rolled onto a frame, with a couple of kerosene lamps behind it to make it glow or something. Some poor kid is turning an actual crank to move it forward, while this other idiot is supposedly narrating. It's so 2D it hurts my eyes. Gotta love that random function. I seriously consider unplugging from this scene, only I actually get sucked in by the story. This one Sioux hunter dares his friend to kill this white farmer, so the friend kills the farmer's whole family. Then all the Sioux go on a rampage and kill hundreds of settlers. They cut off people's heads, rape women, torture children, and loot a few towns. It really gets the audience riled up. This ridiculous, unsophisticated agitprop has done the trick. And if I was one of these guys, I'd be ready to kill the savages too. But I'm not buying it. If there's one thing every Indian knows, it's this. When it comes to history, Always get a second opinion. At least I got one thing out of coming here. I know where I'm going next. So that's the first episode. And um, what happened, so I'm going to just show you like three little bits. So what I was trying to do was use Hunter as... Um, I guess an allegory, if that's the right word, <laughs> for all Native people. And he's starting, in the story we start off where I place Native people in the 1950s, at this place where our um, existence was not assured. And so, and it was like a really bad time to be Indian at that time. 
And, um, but what I think happened, thanks to, for, well, through a lot of forces, um, is that people started to look toward their heritage and learn about it and sort of pull, pull, it at, pull that back out of the earth. I mean, what I mean is uh, out of memory and out of the past and reclaim it and revitalize it. And so that's kind of what happens to Hunter. And what I wanted to show was, uh, in addition to showing Native people in the future, I wanted to show us successful. And I chose in this world that success would be tied to money and fame. <laughs> because uh, for lots of reasons. One thing is uh, there's not very many images of us, famous or rich. But also uh, I felt that I, I forgot what I was going to say. I'm sorry. <laughs> anyway, I'll it'll come back to me. And um, sorry, that threw me off a little. Um, but anyway, I think, uh, so yes, right. So he needs to, another, another indicator though of success I think is love. And so I wanted him to have the love of another person. And so there's a girl in this and uh, in uh, episode four she shows up and in my my intention in doing this piece was to uh, it was really to focus on Hunter but somehow Gorak Wahawi who is the young Mohawk woman that he meets who's from our time she ended up having a much bigger part in this in this uh, whole show in this whole machinima than I had intended and so what we're going to see now is we're going to is is Garako Howie, and actually what's happened is there's a whole episode, there's a whole two episodes just with Garako Howie. What happens is Hunter shows up in Gahnawage, which is where she's from, that's my reserve, and uh, he has his glasses and he drops them. And she, you know, he, he just flashes on, but the glasses stay behind. And so Garako Howie picks them up and she puts them on, she sees the HUD and everything, and she like waves her hands around and she's like in the future at this powwow in 2112, and she's like, what's going on? I'm in the future. And she, you know, has this little, ad, you know, adventure there. So that's episode four. You can all watch episode five. She like figures out how to use it. And then she has a paper to write for our history class. So she goes to see, you know, Kateri Tekakwita, this famous person and writes about, you know, has this awesome paper now because she goes to see her. And then finally in episode six, she goes to Alcatraz Island and they finally meet. And, uh, and so that's uh, basically what you're going to see right now, just a little three-minute snippet now of, of what happens there. I, th I, think, uh, I think they haven't, maybe they've just met. They've just met, yes. And in the HUD, you see like, like their biorhythms are at an all-time high. <laughs> and so they're like, oh my God, it's sort of like a love at first sight moment. And then the rest, and then this happens. This land is your land. This land is my land, from the Atlantic Ocean to Alcatraz Island, from the Arctic Circle to the Gulf Stream waters. This land was made for you and me. Hey, you know what we should do here? Start a university. Yeah, an Indian university. With Indian subjects taught by Indian professors. And elders. What would the Indian subjects be? Agriculture? Traditional medicines. Cosmology. Politics. Ah. <laughs> hey, wanna watch the lights come on in San Francisco? I can't figure out how you got my glasses. I guess it was magic. That puts the active in interactive mode. What do you mean? Well, the fact that I'm sitting in my storage locker in Montreal in 2121, and you're in your comfy bedroom on the res in 2011, and we just kissed and it felt like an electric shock. Oh, you felt an electric shock, eh? Yeah, let's do it again.
I never knew cyber sex could be so... Mind-blowing? Realistic. So what's your plan for today? Patrol the island. The place is falling apart. It's really dangerous, especially for the kids. What are you gonna do? I'm on KP. Kitchen patrol. Keep peeling. I think there are about a hundred pounds of potatoes with my name on them. There's a real division of labor around here, eh? Yeah. Feminism came to Indian country a little later than it came to the rest of North America. Clan mothers and matrilineal societies notwithstanding. Oh, a university girl. <laughs> you know it. Something's wrong. What? I'm going to find out. So that's that part. And and then they decide. Uh, so big thing that happens is that they decide to live together. But and they decide that she's going to go to the future. And so I I chose that, of course, on purpose, because um, I think on. So there's a few things, right? I feel that I think this is changing now, but certainly when I started on this idea of, of doing stuff in the future that a lot of Native people, and especially our youth, really felt like, not just that there was no future, but that everything great about us was in the past. And so I really wanted her to choose the future, you know? And so there's, I mean, so, the, you know, I think people didn't want to leave, you know, that their, yeah, their present wasn't great. Also, there's a whole thing of never leaving the reserve. like people don't want to leave for some good reasons and some maybe not so good reasons. And so that was uh, what I did there. And, um, but I actually, I don't think I'm showing you that part, that exact moment where she chooses, but you get to, I'll leave something for you to watch uh, in the show. But I'll show, and so I'll just show you the next part right now and I'll tell you about it after if I need to. The glasses are more addictive than bejeweled. After I finish my final semester, Hunter and I go on a time traveler joyride. We visit Pocahontas in England. I had no idea she was Queen Anne's BFF. We walk with Sacagawea to the shore of the Pacific and see the big fish as she called it. But the best stuff is the future. Well, my future. It's all well in the past for Hunter. Indigenous peoples everywhere have made incredible advancements. It starts when Quebec finally separates from Canada. The Cree promptly separate from Quebec and form a confederacy with all their cousins to the West. The Haudenosaunee soon follow, then the Anishinaabe, then the Blackfoot. I guess all our hard work finally pays off. Just that little thing. <laughs> so as I'm making these, right, I'm thinking about that, what I told you at the beginning, what do, what do Native people look like in cyberspace? How can we tell that a person, that a character or, per, you know, is Native? And uh, so I, you know, I'm thinking about all this. And uh, these are some of the, the characters that appear throughout, that, throughout Time Traveler TM that are supposed to be native. It's easier when they're from the past. Eh? <laughs> Did anybody recognize this guy? Da, 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 Raven from Snow Crash. <laughs> so my avatar is XOX Voyager. So I was XOX in the palace but it's Second Life required me to have a last name, so. And uh, this is how I looked over time. So here I have demo hair on. So this is when, uh, we talked a little bit, I did a, I spoke with Angela's class today and we talked about, um, you know, having only free stuff and then starting to be able to pay and or deciding to pay for stuff in Second Life. So this is when I was wearing nothing but free stuff, right? So demo hair, this awful, f our f you know, we call this our flight jumpsuit. Because everyone on my team wore this. <laughs> and, uh, 
And then here was this guy who w clearly had money because, you know, he was like completely modded and customized and super cool. And we loved him. That's the Abtech t-shirt. So Abtech logo on the t-shirt. And, uh, you know, braids are a thing, a little bit of native jewelry. So when I did episode three, which is about the Oka crisis that happened uh, in Canada near my, with, you know, my reserve was involved in that. Um, I made some ribbon shirts for my avatars, some of the avatars. And so ribbon shirt is part of our traditional regalia. And I was like, hey, I want my avatar to have a ribbon shirt too. You know, why did just, you know, so we started to make the avatar ribbon shirt. And this is our very first version. This is when there was, uh, you know, when the clothes in Second Life were still basically painted on to the body. Like there was, that's, yeah. That's why all their clothes were so tight. They just didn't have the, <laughs> they didn't have the, <laughs> the skills yet. So I had this, then I said, well, wait a minute, I don't have a ribbon shirt. I want a ribbon shirt, you know? And then I, I started to have this idea that I really wanted to dress like my avatar. Um, so this is, you know, 2010. I hadn't heard of cosplay yet, <laughs> but I know it was a thing. <laughs> anyway, so I was asked to come to this, this performance art, or not performance art, but um, anyway, performance studies. Uh, conference and I asked if they thought you know to give a talk uh, called tr you know trans indigeneity or something like that and and I was like oh well do you think it would make sense if I dressed as my avatar and she's like would you <laughs> so oh my god it was a disaster as you can see I do not I, this was a failure in my opinion okay I mean I you know first of all like everything was wrong like that everything's wrong the boots are wrong the tutu's wrong the shirt was okay but it wasn't, you know, it was it was not like costume enough. And then the hair was a sad story because my talk was at 9 a.m. and no hairdresser would open before 9 to do my hair, it, like my avatar's hair. And so I bought like this white hairspray stuff, color, you know, and like braided my hair and it was just terrible. <laughs> so <laughs> that's just, yeah. So this, but this stayed in my mind. I really still thought it was a pretty good idea, you know. And so I, I wanted to do, I wanted a redo. So I, uh, one student who came through uh, Aboriginal Territories and Cyberspace was a costume designer. And I was like, oh my God, do you think you can help me design a ribbon shirt for my, like that, for my avatar? Like something way better than what I have now. So she designs this like in a traditional, like draws it way. And then like another of the students who was really good at Second Life, like made the costume for my avatar. Then I found this hair that I liked way better than the white hair. And that's when I took, and, and then we made, the we made the new shirt. Like now we can import stuff that we're making in Maya and stuff. And so this image happened. And um, so this image happened. So, so what I'm trying to do here, in case I haven't made it very clear, is I'm trying to get a shirt for myself and a whole outfit for myself and a whole outfit for my avatar that match. Okay, so I had to iterate on both sides in the real world and in the virtual world in order to get these two things look the same. And so what I'm doing in this picture actually was I was trying to figure out, oh yeah, I knew, I thought in the picture that I really, really wanted something in the background. I really wanted something that told you more information. I felt it was a lost opportunity to just have white. And so I was trying to think, okay, well, I was thinking about First, I, a big one thing I was going to do is have this topiary because I feel like that's sort of like man and nature, like man wanting to control nature, you know. And so I had a few pictures of that, but the Second Life one was really gross. And then, uh, and then I was, so also I was thinking about the title of the work. And I was, uh, I, oh yeah, because it was going to be in a show called The Rebel Yells. Okay, which is a famous Canadian artist's work, ne Shelley Nero. The work is called the Rebel Yell. Uh, the Rebel, Rebel Yell, I think, <laughs> has nothing to do with Billy Idol. Nothing. But I am from the '80s, and I was like, nobody's gonna do anything that refers to Billy Idol. That's not right. So <laughs> I, I, I go and I look at like I'm like, well, the title of my work is gonna have a reference to Billy Idol. So I go uh, on, you know, go on to the interwebs, and I'm like, you know what? What was Billy Idol? What are some of his songs? Let me remember some of the songs. So of course, Dancing with Myself comes up. And I watched the video, and it's filled with zombies, mannequins, um, ventriloquist dummies, uh, basically all the things that are 
basically to me an, what an avatar is, this hum these human forms that are not human. And so I, I was like, that's the title. Obviously, it's Dancing with Myself. And so as, I'm, as you recall, this is not the final image that I, of the piece that I'm doing, but I'm taking the image in order to figure out what's the background going to be and what's my pose going to be. And so I took this image and I just thought it was terrific. And since I, I wanted to use it for another show, I, I also I titled it She is Dancing with Herself. Really, what I think the title what really the title should have been is She is Playing with Herself, but that would have sounded not what I wanted it to be, <laughs> like a little too titillating. But the idea that, you know, it's a doll, it's sort of this 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 thing we play with that looks like a human but isn't. So um, so that's what happened. So then the next thing that happened is now we, we, we've got this, I don't remember my next slide, so I don't want to like reveal too soon, but we've got the shirt, okay, in real life, and we've got the shirt and the avatar. I find the tutu. I find the boots. Now I need someone who can do that hair. I find her. She's amazing. She works for Cirque du Soleil when they're in Montreal. Like, she's like this amazing girl. And I, you know, I meet her, and we, like we figure out how to make these things, and it's going to be like fake dreads, uh, mesh tubing, and glow sticks, okay? And so I show up. So now we have to do a practice run, right? Because and it's the day before the shoot, by the way, this big photo shoot where I'm going to wear all this stuff and have my hair done. And you know, we're oh, I also, I also 3D, I also modeled in 3D. See her little like dilly bopper things? I made those. Okay, we had it all planned out. Anyway, she's putting it in my hair, and it's killing. She's got these bobby pins. She's sticking in my head, and they're just, they're huge. They're this long, and they're, like, falling. And she's like, maybe we, we're trying everything. And it's just like, I'm like, I can do it. I can do it. She's like, you've never done a photo shoot. It's going to be four hours, or at least. You're going to be in pain. You can't do it. So we had to find another hairdo. Oh, yep, pattern. Pattern for the shirt. Dun, dun, dun. I think it's here. Yes. And so that's the final image. So this <laughs> I'm happy with. And so so this happened. And when this ha after this happened, so what what is my next thing here? Oh yeah. Okay. Well, I, I actually this gave me uh, this gave me the idea for the next piece which I is not finished yet. It's like I'm actually working on it right now and it will be in a show in one week, so it's got to be finished soon. <laughs> but it's really close and it was also a trial and tribulation. Oh my god. The idea was I've been thinking for so long about Barbie dolls and a bit their relationship to Second Life, but also their relationship to corn husk dolls. A corn husk doll is a old, old, traditional Iroquois, well, f it was originally really a doll for a child to play with, but actually now they're mostly like figurines that sit in like, you know, in reserve houses, <laughs> like really beautiful dolls. I don't have any images of them here. But I wanted to put, uh, I wanted, I felt like it would be so interesting to talk about the corn husk doll who is very pale skinned. The hair of a traditional corn husk doll is the, the corn silk, so it's very light colored. And to say that that's Barbie's ancestor. Like I, I really thought that would make sense, but I could never think of how to really show that until I made this project. And it was just like, ding, an avatar, a Barbie, a corn husk doll all wearing this outfit. <laughs> <laughs> and what a mistake that was. <laughs> oh my god. It's almost done, but it was it took every bit of sewing skill that I had because you see it doesn't matter that she has big hair, this avatar and a little tiny shirt that has no zipper or opening. <laughs> when we made my shirt, it was really hard to get in it, but it had like a little stretchy thing right here, that's how I got in it. And then we did my hair afterwards. But the dolls, we couldn't do that. I had to, I, I got the same amazing hairdresser to do the doll hairs, the dolls' hairs. <laughs> uh, and then I made, I was making the outfits. And so the dolls come back to me and I'm like, I can't put the outfit on the doll. So I had to like redesign it so that it would like, basically I had to sew her in to the doll, into it. So anyway, that'll be a, a sh a something that I'm going to show you later. And I hope I'm not, uh, how am I doing on time, Angela? Because, oh, Including the, the for the, I, I actually don't even have 15 minutes more worth to say. So I have probably 10 minutes still. Um, so yeah, I, I was thinking about, uh, does, do people know the artist Mariko Mori? So I, I was, 
I, I can't remember why I was thinking about her, but oh, of course. So I have lots of students coming through. I'm actually not a teacher. I'm so incredibly lucky. I get to sort of just, for doing some of the partnership work, like uh, that sort of administrative and liaison type work, I, uh, you know, I, I have to do that, but I also get to do a lot of my artwork. And I have all these amazing students who come and, and tell me their opinions of what I should make. <laughs> And this one was like, you have to make your own avatar. We can do it now. I'm going to sculpt it for you. I'm going to make you an avatar. And he made it, and it was really ugly. And so, <laughs> however, I, I took this picture of it, which I would have been smart to put in here just so you could see it, but I'm sorry. I didn't think of that at the time. And I called it Birth of an Avatar. And then I thought, why is that ringing a bell? And then I remembered this piece by Mariko Mori. Not this piece. Again, should have put that in, eh? That would have been smart. Sorry. <laughs> but Mariko Mori has this really awesome piece where she's cosplaying, too. And, um, and she's, she's, wearing, uh, she's wearing this, like, pop she calls it a pop star outfit, but she's also wearing, so it's like a cute little skirt, and she's got, like, these contact lenses in, and... Um, she's got these these floating balls around her and i think you know so she's talking so first of all she's referencing like how amazing photoshop was because it like wasn't a thing yet really and so how can you make this picture well with photoshop now we can have like these balls floating around and then you know she's talking about well actually she's talking about japanese culture so i was thinking but well how can i talk about uh, you know i want to i'm actually talking about all the same things as her i thought you know and i was like well maybe we should sort of time to do a bit of an update if you will you know or how, you know, anyway, I felt like it would be so easy to make, to recreate, and this one was a p pretty easy piece, actually, to recreate Mariko Mori's piece, and so in Second Life, and I've, you know, decided, uh, I was, I was thinking about actually having her outfit on me, and then I was like, this is kind of like my avatar's costume, it's like my superhero outfit, you know, I, I think I need to still wear this outfit, and so, uh, so I made this piece, and it's brand new, and I printed it, and framed it, and it looks really nice, and it's big. I made it the exact same size as hers, so 70 inches tall by, f by uh, 40, I think, or 45 inches wide. And then uh, another work that I'm going to have uh, in this upcoming show that is, uh, so now, you know, I've, I've been sort of thinking about my avatar and thinking about virtual worlds. What is the, av you know, what is the relationship between the avatar and the human? What is the relationship between this virtual place and the real territory and the land? You know, in Iroquois culture, the Thanksgiving address is this, th this wonderful, beautiful piece of oration that thanks every part of the natural world. And start in the way we do it, because there's different versions of that too, we start with the people, but then we go down from the earth and the water all the way to sky world. And so I, w I wondered what it would mean if my avatar did the Thanksgiving address in this virtual space. And so I've, I've done it. So this is, this is like the shortest mission I ever did. <laughs> it's one minute long, and I didn't do the whole Thanksgiving address. I'm just thanking the people. So I just would like to play for you and, and see what you think. Ohandu garewadakwa. Aguego oska. On de de wa we nuni, ne unqua ni gura, tano teo tinuaradu, ne ungwe sua. To neo tunhak, ne unqua ni gura. Le mo avant tout chose. Nous unissons nos esprits pour offrir nos remerciements et salutations aux gens. Maintenant, nos esprits ne font qu'un. Words before all else. We bring our minds together as one, as we give thanks for the people. Now our minds are one. Okay. That is my talk. <laughs>